So welcome everyone who is, you know, here with us for the chat session. My name is uh, Michael Dankwa and I'm a, you know, research fellow at UNU Wider. Uh, we will have a chat with Professor Augustine Fosu from the University of Ghana. And just as you've seen, we would talk about institutions and governance in uh, sub-Saharan, you know, Africa. Many of you will know uh, Professor Augustine Fosu. Uh, you know, he's worked at the AERC, he's worked for the UNECA, he's worked here at UNU wider as well. And just as you may know, he's done a lot of work in the subject that we would uh, talk about uh, to, uh, today. One last thing I would add is that Augustine is also a very good mentor as well. He's a great mentor as well. So if you want to drop him a line, he would get back to you and uh, would you know offer you good counsel you know, in that case. A couple of things we would have the chat for what do you call it 20 minutes and there are two things that you just have to note we would want this to be as inter interactive as possible and so if you have any question drop it in the q and a chat or you you can also re, re what do you call it quest and i would give you the opportunity to ask your 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 question live in this case so get get involved and uh, feel free to ask your questions as well so let, let me start with you with, with your prop with your prop i mean you've done a lot of work in this area in this area of institutions and african economies institutions economic governance and you know human the development. I was just going through some of the work that you have done and you know the some of the AAE supplements with Robert Bates and Co. and some of the what do you call it the special issues and all that that you you have done. I just wanted to ask, I mean, what have we learned with with all these work? What are the key issues? What are some of the things that you would want to share? with us. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, again, my name is Augustin Fosu, uh, and I'm speaking from the University of Ghana, uh, Legon in Ghana right now. Um, you know, institutions have been around for many, many, many years, going all the way back in terms of importance of institutions, generally speaking. And for African countries, the important institutions was realized uh, following the uh, dismal growth performance in the 1980s, in particular, and late 1970s. And you may recall that the Washington Consensus was developed, but then Roderick came around and said, by the way, the Washington Consensus for has omitted an important aspect, and that is the role of institutions. Hence, we ended up the augmented Washington Consensus, which shows the importance of institutions. The African Economic Research Consortium, AERC, also organized a project called Explaining African Economic Growth, called the Growth Project, in short, which also had a proposition that institutions were actually sine qua non when it comes to African growth. And much of my work takes off from the work of the African Economic uh, Research Consortium, AERC, uh, where I indicate, I found that 
Indeed, institutions are important in terms of preventing policy syndromes, that is anti-growth policy syndromes, and there are many of them. So the idea will be to have a regime called syndrome-free regime. So the question becomes, what influences a syndrome-free regime, which would then lead us to more growth and improve development? So that is something that has been found already. And the question becomes, are there any institutional levers that we can pull to ensure that we have a greater prevalence uh, of uh, syndrome-free regimes? So that is where we are pretty much. Mm. Mm. All right. So my, what do you call it, the audience, we, we would want to have your, if you have any question, please let, let me know. You could put that in the Q&A chat, or I could give you the opportunity also to accept live as, 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 as well. But, Prof, I mean, coming back to the main discussion, I mean, we, 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 we would want to dive down to look at what are the challenges of institutions. In this case, based on the on the syndrome-free approach that you did talk ab 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 about, what are some of the things? I mean, what are some of the the what do you call it, the barriers that uh, sub-Saharan African countries may have to deal with in order to, you know, boost growth in this case? Yes. Uh, obviously, you know, what are some of these uh, syndromes? Uh, in, the, in the case of uh, having all kinds of uh, uh, regulation uh, on the economy, uh, policy syndromes in terms of a state breakdown, in terms of uh, suboptimal, uh, intertemporal decision making, uh, and adverse redistribution. These are the policy syndromes that we need to do something about. So if you look at government, what led many governments to end up uh, affecting um, these policy syndromes? And I contend that it is because many of these governments were free, too free to act, specifically the executive branch of government. So if a president wants uh, an international airport based upon uh, based in his hometown, for example, he has the power to do that, even though that may be suboptimal location of resources. And sometimes that would bring about a lot of inefficiency. I could give you specific examples, but I'm not going to do that uh, in this uh, conversation. Uh, so I'm, I'll make a more general statement. And so the question then becomes, can we uh, increase the constraint on the executive branch of government as a way of preventing these policy syndromes. Mm -hmm. And my recent work indicates that indeed, as cons that this constraint on the executive may be an important lever that we can, we can uh, pull, I mean, to what uh, to prevent these syndromes. And if we were able to pull enough of it, then you end up with a situation uh, where uh, you have uh, the syndrome being minimized, and independently, it would actually reduce syndrome-free. Uh, it would could also act to mitigate the pernicious effect of ethnicity. Mm -hmm. It turns out in the analysis, actually, you can have, once again, ESCOMs increasing syndrome-free prevalence, mm -hmm. and therefore increasing growth, or can do that interactively Mm. in terms of reducing the potential deleterious effect of ethnicity mm. and therefore improve the growth outcome. Mm. 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 But I mean, uh, so apart from the constraint on the executive, I mean, that's, that is maybe one thing that you, you've done, you know, some work on. But in the, in the context of Sub-Saharan Africa, 
what 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 do you call the factors come to mind apart from this Look, looking at it from the context of sub-saharan africa yes actually my work is in the context of sub-saharan africa yeah the asc but project was about sub-saharan africa right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously we have all kinds of institutions include you know, if we talk about development governance, developmental governance, for example, mm -hmm. uh, the need to uh, to have uh, what we call poly, uh, coherent economic policy mm -hmm. situation as free market policies of having effective uh, public service and mm -hmm. having limited corruption. And that is how sometimes developmental governance is defined. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that once again, ESCOMs happens to be an important uh, tool, I mean, to, uh, bring in, uh, to, to bring in about development to governance. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. you know, in the final analysis, obviously, um, it comes to the primacy of institutions. Mm. And this is the work of Roderick and others, uh, which uh, seems to indicate that institutions are primary mm. in terms of trumping the effects of geography mm. uh, and integration. Mm. Yeah. So in the final analysis, the fundamental factor then in terms of influencing growth uh, becomes uh, institutions, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so the ESCONS actually is just one of these levers. levers. Obviously, rule of law is important. Uh, poverty rights are uh, very important. Uh, you know, so having political rights and civil liberties, uh, that is uh, you know, quite uh, crucial, and so on and so on. Uh, so the question becomes then, how can we influence, I mean, these, you know, kinds of uh, um, variables that in turn influence the economic outcome uh, in terms of growth uh, and development. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe, maybe, now, maybe things, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, go, go ahead, Prof. Now, a challenge becomes, I know that people talk about whether indeed they should be democratic institutions or something else. And strong belief that dictatorships uh, can be important mm -hmm. uh, in terms of bringing about growth and development. Yes, it is true. If you happen to get a benevolent dictator, that benevolent dictator can bring about growth and development. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, benevolent dictatorship uh, is it, not something that operates in the long run. In the mm -hmm. short run, Yes, but not in the long run. Mm. Um, people get corrupted over time. Uh, essentially, uh, authority has a way of corrupting uh, leaders. Uh, but yes, if you can do that. Mm. However, it turns out that from some type of having a long-term development, growth and development, require uh, a democratic environment mm. and a democratic framework I mean, to do that. So the question then becomes how can we ensure that we have appropriate democratic dispensation um, mm -hmm. to bring about development mm -hmm. and you know some people actually point to china and they say oh by the way the chinese are not democratic but you know they do have a strong economic development well first of all china is not africa mm -hmm. and secondly even the communist party itself at least happened to be democratic internally mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe until very recently. Mm -hmm. uh, but so, in some sense, there needs to be some democratic elements in order to, for, for us to have any type of long term uh, growth and development. Right. So, yes. So now we come to democracy, but there are other problems, like the side mm -hmm. effects of democracy, mm -hmm. especially multi party democracy. And that's the fact that there's a tendency for the government to overcommit in terms of uh, uh, providing perhaps local public goods mm. as opposed to national public goods. Mm. And they also end up perhaps not collecting enough taxes. Mm. Hence, we end up with a situation where we have a huge budget deficit, chronic budget deficit, mm. uh, which then lead to huge debt in these economies. Mm. And these are the challenges that we need to do something about if indeed we're mm. going to continue with that type of multi-party democracy. Mm. 
Okay, excellent. Provide. Uh, I have one uh, one uh, question here from Daniel Chachu, and uh, Daniel, would you want to ask your what do you call the question live? No, you can even you, you can even re re respond to me. Let me do, do that for for you. So Daniel would want to know what are the what are the levers of effective uh, constraints on on uh, on the uh, executive power let, let me take that again what are the levers for effective constraints on executive uh, power for you know instance a significant weakness remain regarding the role of uh, parliament especially if a majority of members belong to the same ruling party that that is a tough one that's mm -hmm. a real tough one uh, because uh, we need to have enough checks and balances in the system. And so if indeed you have a legislature uh, that mm -hmm. also belongs to the executive, if mm -hmm. you will, then it becomes quite difficult. I mean, one potential solution is to have a situation uh, where uh, you, not, you have enough constraints built into the constitution, right? Mm -hmm who should certainly limit the power of the, the chief executive uh, mm. without necessarily even having parliament come in mm. uh, to do that. Mm. So if the rules are there that say that, look, um, the uh, chief executive uh, can nominate so many uh, you know, people to head uh, offices, et cetera, they can, uh, they can actually choose uh, district uh, commissioners um, in, in a very limited type of way, uh, then the chief executive in terms of executive branch of the government has no, you know, they really have no um, uh, leverage uh, mm. but to abide by these types of rules. Mm. So mm. it has to be built into the system somehow. Mm. Uh, we should also have uh, CSOs, uh, civil society organizations, uh, not rest and make sure that the government uh, does the right thing. Mm. That, that, that's important. The media, the role of media here is critical mm. uh, to ensure that they unearth in any types of uh, wrongdoings um, and you know, you know, bureaucratic messes, um, corruption, uh, mm. those kinds of issues, and make sure that uh, we take distance up uh, and provide the appropriate critique and the environment to ensure that the, the executive behaves properly. Mm. But, 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 Prof, following from this, I mean, so we've, you've talked about the media and the CSOs and, and the work that they, they, they do. I mean, from my own experience, I mean, criticizing the, the, the government is one thing. I mean, bringing things to the fore is one thing. But how do they, I mean, you know, the, the, it's, it's 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 like they talk they they, they give they, they they say what they have to say but not, nothing happens i mean you know so so i mean is it is is there another level of 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 what you call that something that can be done what is the gap there so that because the translation of some of these critiques and doesn't seem to get anywhere with, with, with the regards to countries in sub-Saharan, you know, Africa. One potential solution, Michael, will be through decentralization. Mm -hmm. A major part of the problem is that the central government has too much power uh, in terms of the power of the purse, uh, providing revenues uh, for local public goods. Uh, you know, for example, so if there were effective decentralization uh, so that localities can raise their own revenue sufficiently and there's some type of cost sharing, uh, then I think that the central government is more likely to behave itself because mm. it does not have that uh, you know, veto power uh, mm. when it comes to the appropriate revenues for localities to act. Mm. So decentralization here becomes very critical in my view Mm. Uh, as a way of getting around the problem. Uh, currently, a lot of localities have so they have so-called expenditure autonomy, but not revenue autonomy. Mm. But with that revenue autonomy, 
spatial autonomy, autonomy is not very viable mm. in terms of its implications for growth mm. and development. Mm. So if there were greater level of decentralization, we could then reduce uh, the power and authority of gov or the central government and therefore the executive uh, branch of government. Uh, mm. And I think that would help go a long way uh, in ensuring that uh, the central government would indeed behave. Mm. 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 Let me let me ask uh, ask this uh, question. Uh, in this, I mean, there are there, there are many of us here who are working on many other uh, things. But in case someone want to do something re related to institutions, governance, and let's say African, what do you call it, uh, economies? What, 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 which, what, what do you call it, the area would you want the person to f f focus on based on your, your, you know, expertise in that uh, area? What are some of the gaps in terms of, uh, you know, re re research? One, I think it would be important uh, to have a better understanding of the workings of democracy. Mm. And if indeed the multi-party democracy as practiced uh, today uh, is the best way to go or whether there should be some type of uh, changes uh, in the system somehow, uh, this issue the winner all kinds of policies mm -hmm. because if a given party wins the election, then obviously the, 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 that party pretty much has free authority, if you will, uh, overriding authority I mean, to act, to appoint heads of organizations and all kind of stuff. But if there was some you know, type of arrangement uh, where they could divide up the pie, if you will, uh, then that might be minimized. So that's one way, I mean, to go to try to find out what will be the flow of the, of, of the democratic type of government that will be more suitable. Another way would be to, uh, to, to, to investigate uh, the level of decentralization, I mean, that uh, will be the best way to go and the extent to which, for example, the central government uh, should, you know, should subsidize education uh, at the local level, for example. As you well know, we have free SHS uh, in Ghana right now. Mm -hmm. And we also know that, uh, you know, the uh, uh, fees that the students pay at the undergraduate level is quite minimal, about $300. Mm -hmm year compared to $50,000 in the United States of America. Mm. The point is this, uh, that if indeed individuals can get free lunch, which you know doesn't exist in economics, they'll go for it. Mm. And so the various localities, would they all be rivaling uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, you know, for, you know, for the interest, if you will, uh, for favors, uh, from the central government uh, because they know that there's, there's no cost sharing that is pretty much free lunch. If they want an education institution, they get it. Mm. If they want a um, clinic, they get it. Uh, if they want, it, it's, it's fairly free to some extent. Mm. So to what extent there should be some cost sharing to ensure that uh, it would put a limit, if you will, constraint on their demands mm. uh, on the central government? I think that's an important area I mean, to delve into. Mm -hmm. Many things, uh, Prof. Are they, are they, we don't have that much, but this is just off my, but I mean, I'm just thinking in terms of what do you call it, a, a prospect? I mean, with re, regards to, okay, I, I, I have what do you call it, a, a question here from Daniel, so I, I would just, I'll read that out for, for, for you, bro. Says, what are your views on the state of of play of governance in Africa? Should we see the the uh, the uh, coup d'état in uh, Mali and uh, uh, Guinea as just uh, as just uh, hiccups? How should we view the situation in a place like Ethiopia? For example, where hundreds are dying virtually every week. So this is this is a from Daniel again. Daniel, thank you very much. This is quite tough. <laughs> but you see, 
uh, if you read one of my papers uh, where I talk about intermediate level democracy versus advanced level democracy in Africa, uh, you find that under the former that's intermediate level democracy, this is where you're transitioning from dictatorship into uh, d democracy that is very treacherous. So for example, in the case of Ethiopia, uh, Ethiopia was doing re quite reasonably well, but pretty much under a high relatively high level of dictatorship, if you will. So now that the uh, political space has opened up, you have a certain amount of political, um, in, 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 in a political uh, negative political type of situation uh, where uh, you have some challenges. And obviously, if that leads to um, government failure, if you will, mm -hmm. or state breakdown, that certainly will reduce the momentum to have greater growth and so on. So yes, so the point essentially is this, that we should do whatever we can, we can to prevent uh, civil war, uh, to prevent state breakdown, to prevent coup d'etat and so on. Uh, other people have worked, some of my own work indicates clearly that coup d'etat uh, certainly is not uh, a good uh, uh, mechanism uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to growth and development. So we should do whatever we can to prevent you know, these kinds of uh, incidents uh, occurring. Uh, and certainly, you know, we should not encourage them at all. Now, what democratic dispensation has done recently is to uh, attenuate uh, these types of incidents uh, because if people wait long enough, four years, whatever it is, they can change the government if they do not like what the government is doing. Mm. Yeah. So if you look at the evidence, it's quite clear that uh, there has been attenuation of the incidents mm. of these kinds of uh, elite political, political instability uh, and so on, uh, but so they may happen. And if, whenever they do, uh, we should make sure that uh, they are short-lived. Right. Let me let me ask the last uh, question is from, is from Anne Wersha. And this is the question. It says, do you think that in a highly literate country, long run dictatorship can become benevolent since literate people are aware of their rights and may topple down the uh, government the that short response the short response is no <laughs> the short response is no okay uh, because i'm sure that they want uh, their political rights civil liberties they want their freedom mm. uh, and uh, they wouldn't want anyone dictating to them Mm. Uh, so uh, they would indeed uh, vouch for uh, uh, democratic framework, uh, democratic mm. dispensation. All right, m m many thanks, Prof. We are actually out of uh, time. So I would want to uh, thank you for t taking uh, t time to uh, talk to us on this, you know, important uh, subject matter. And to everyone who, you know, join us and for your brilliant questions uh, as well. So many thanks, Prof. And it was great to see you. <laughs> My pleasure, Michael. Thank you very much for giving yeah. me the opportunity. And it's great to yeah. see you as well. Great. And thank I thank you. everyone for participating.